and um, any announcements. So it's my pleasure to introduce um, <clears throat> today's speaker, uh, Dr. Mete Citron Pastrana, who is a PGY4 adult resident and is expected to graduate in June of 2024. Uh, she received her medical degree from the University of Puerto Rico School of Medicine and a bachelor's degree in molecular biology from the University of Puerto Rico. Throughout her career, um, Dr. Citron Pastrana has been recognized for her academic excellence and dedication to community service, receiving accolades such as the inclusion in the Honor Roll Society of the University of Puerto Rico School and the Remillard Family Community Service Fund Award during her PGY2 um, year. Dr. Citron Pastrana's research interests span a broad range of topics within psychiatry. She has served as a sub-investigator in a study investigating psilocybin therapy and esketamine therapy for treatment-resistant depression here at UMass. And she has contributed to research on excoriation disorder, refractory schizophrenia, and interventions for ADHD, among other topics. She's been an active contributor to community service initiatives such as Project Success, a social skills training program for individuals with severe mental illness and the UMass Mind Community Intervention Program here, a peer mentorship program for college students with serious mental illness. In addition to her clinical and research roles, Dr. Sistrom Pastrana is actively involved in teaching and mentoring and I'm happy to say she has served as the psychopharmacology and research chief resident at UMass Chan this year, <clears throat> guiding and teaching other residents. Dr. Sintron Pastrana is bilingual, being a native Spanish speaker and proficient in English. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say she uh, has uh, submitted a paper which uh, to the Journal of Clinical Psychopharmacology on a different topic than what she's going to talk on today. And that uh, paper uh, has been uh, accepted as a uh, poster session for this year's uh, coming uh, American Psychiatric Association annual meeting. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Mete Citron Pastrana. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Rothschild. So as good afternoon, as many of you know, I'm Maite Adriana Cintron Pastrana. I'm a fourth year psychiatry resident here at UMass. And today I'm gonna to be talking about psychedelics, a promising treatment for mental health conditions. I hereby disclose that I have no actual or potential conflict of interest in relation to this presentation. Today, I'm gonna to be talking to you about the history of psychedelics, psychedelics in the 21st century, the psychopharmacology of psychedelics, Psychedelics Assisted Psychotherapy, The Mystical Experience, and Psychedelics at UMass. Psychedelics, perhaps humanity's oldest psychopharmacological substance, has a history woven through millennial of religious and medicinal traditions. From the Greek to the Aztecs, who called psilocybin theonononacactal, or flesh of the gods, these substances have held deep-rooted significance through millennial. Despite the Spanish conquest and the Roman Catholic Church pushing psilocybin use underground, its legacy still endures till this day. However, modern research into psychedelics didn't start until the mid 1940s with the discovery of LSD. In 1938, Albert Hoffman, a Swiss chemist, isolated LSD 25 from rye ergots or mushrooms, looking for a medication to stimulate circulation. It was not until 1943, five years later, when he accidentally ingested a small quantity of LSD and realized the psychedelic effects on a bike ride home during World War II. In 1947, Sandoz Laboratories were sending LSD throughout the world to researchers. And in 1950, LSD was one of the most studied drugs in the world. In the 1950s, the British psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond and his colleague Abram Hoffer conducted research at the Weyburn Mental Hospital in Saskatchewan, Canada. They were looking to see the effects of LSD on alcoholism. Despite their initial thoughts that LSD would cause delirium, they found that it actually had a positive effect on its participants, 
finding that 40 to 45 percent of the 2,000 participants remain abstinent a year post treatment. Osmond sought for a name for what LSD caused in the brain, and he consulted his friend, the novelist Adels Huxley, and gave him in 1953 some mescaline to try. Huxley suggested the word phenerothyme and wrote to Osmond to make this trivial world sublime, take half a gram of phenerothyme. Osmond instead chose the word psychedelic from the Greek words psych for minor soul and Dalix for manifesting and wrote back to Huxley to phantom hell or sore angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. In 1956, he announced this in the New York Academy of Sciences. In 1955, the pediatrician Valentina Pavlovna and her husband, the amateur mycologist and banker Gordon Wasson, sample psilocybin at, I'm sorry, at Uaula de Jimenez in Oaxaca, Mexico, at the Sierra Mazateca. Two years later, they chronicled their experiences in Live Magazine and This Week Magazine. These publications marked a significant moment in history as knowledge of psychedelics was introduced to the general public, as knowledge of LSD had only been capped to mental health researchers. In 1958, Hoffman isolates and determines the structure of psilocybin. And in 1960, Sanders introduced indocybin as a research compound in psychiatry. Beginning in the 1950s, psychedelics had been used to treat addiction, depression, OCD, schizophrenia, autism, and end-of-life anxiety. There had been more than 40,000 research participants in more than 1,000 clinical studies. The APA had a meeting just center on LSD, and there had been six international research meetings devoted to psychedelics. Beginning in the 60s, from 1960 to 1962, Dr. Timothy Leary, an American psychologist, and his colleague, Richard Alpert, conducted the Harvard Psilocybin Project, which included the Concord Prison Experiment and the Good Friday Experiment at the Boston University March Chapel. Dr. Leary's research methods were called into question, and he was criticized for participating in the psychedelic experience alongside his subjects and allegedly pressuring students to join the experiment. These ethical concerns led to Leary's dismissal from Harvard in May 1963 alongside his colleague Richard Alpert, later known as Ram Dass. Despite the controversy, Leary, who developed the eight model of consciousness, continued to promote the use of psychedelics, becoming a prominent figure in the counterculture movement of the 1960s. He's also known for popularizing the catchphrases, turn on, tune in, drop out, set and setting, think for yourself and question authority. Evaluations about Leary are polarized. According to the poet Allen Ginsberg, he was a hero of American consciousness, but to President Nixon, he was the most dangerous man in America. In the 1960s, Leary was arrested around 36 times. The introduction of LSD and psilocybin to the general public is closely related to the counterculture movement in the 1960s as for the first time, young people had their own rite of passage, the acid trip, which often led them to experiences largely unknown to the adult world. This cultural shift had a disruptive effect on society, further amplified by the negative publicity of bad trips, flashbacks, psychedelic, I'm sorry, um, psychotic breaks and suicides. In 1965, the widespread enthusiasm for these drugs had turned into moral panic. 
In 1965, Sanders halted LSD production, and in 66, it discontinued the distribution of endocybin to researchers. In the 1970s, LSD was internationally prohibited and considered a Schedule I drug under the Controlled Substance Act of 1970. By the end of the, de the decade, psychedelics, once legal in many places, were outlawed and driven underground. And research into psychedelics stopped for 25 years. It was not until the late 80s when the revival of psychedelics research began. In 1986, one year after MDMA was deemed illegal, Rick Doblin founded MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, as a research and education organization with the goal of proving to the world that psychedelics, when coupled with therapy, were an effective treatment for PTSD. In 1990, the FDA introduced a new group to oversee psychedelic research protocols, opening the doors to modern psychedelic science. This year also marks for the first major psychedelic conference hosted by MAPS, titled Regulation or Prohibition, Psychedelics in the 1990s. In 1992, a group of German researchers published masculine-induced psychopathological, neuropsychological, and neurometabolic effects in 12 healthy male subjects, marking the start of the second wave of clinical trials. They found that masculine induced an acute psychotic state three and a half to four hours after intake as measured by the BPRS and the PDS. They also saw that spec imaging produce a right hemisphere hyperfrontal pattern, which appeared to correlate with the masculine-induced psychosis, challenging the hyperfrontality concept as an explanation for schizophrenia symptoms. In 1994, the year I was born, but yet not born in this date, um, Strassman and others published those response study of DMT. In this study, Two initial IV doses of DMT were given to 12 volunteers, followed by a double-blind randomized administration of four doses of IV DMT. The researchers found that the effects were immediate and abrupt, peaking at two minutes and subsiding by 30 minutes. This study also introduced the hallucino hallucinogen rating scale which brought some understanding about the dose effects of psychedelics. Starting the 21st century, a group of researchers in John Hopkins obtained regulatory approval in the US to resume research with psychedelics in healthy volunteers with no previous experience. In 2004, MAPS begins focusing on the clinical trials to study the effect of NDMA-assisted therapy on PTSD. However, the renaissance of psychedelics does not occur until 2006, and it was highlighted by three events. The first of which happened in Switzerland, in Basel, Switzerland, where a symposium was held to celebrate the centennial birthday of Albert Hoffman. Hoffman spoke about the potential therapeutic and spiritual benefits of LSD. And the symposium discussed ongoing research into psychedelics. The second event, occurred five weeks later in Washington, D.C., when the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that UDV, a religious sect, could import ayahuasca, a drink that has DMT, a Schedule One substance, to use for religious purposes. The third event occurs in Baltimore, Maryland, and it's marked by the publication of the paper, Psilocybin Canocation Mystical Experiences, Mystical Type Experiences, Having Substantial and Sustained personal meaning, and spiritual significance. This was the first double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical study in over four decades to examine the psychological effects of a psychedelic. After the milestone study launch, 
there was a revival of psychedelic research in the 21st century. In 2008, the John Hawking researchers published guidelines for safety, emphasizing safety as a cornerstone, cornerstone of psychedelic research. In 2011, psilocybin eases existential anxiety for patients with advanced stage cancer. In 2014, it helps longtime smoker, smokers quit, and MAPS publishes LSD study. In 2015, it helps patients with alcohol use disorder, and in 2016, it helps patients with treatment-resistant depression. In 2016, there were also reports that a single dose of psilocybin eased existential anxiety in 60 to 80% of patients with life-threatening cancer. In 2018, John Hawking researchers suggest a reclassification recommendation for psilocybin from a Schedule I drug to a Schedule IV drugs, such as sleep aids, but with more control. In 2019, Denver becomes the first U.S. city to decriminalize psilocybin, and John Hopkins launches the Center for Psychedelic Research. In 2020, we had the first RCT of psilocybin-assisted therapy on depression, and Oregon became the first state to decriminalize the use of, of psychedelics for therapeutic use. In 2021, John Hopkins was awarded the first federal grant from the NIH to explore the effects of psychedelics on tobacco use disorder. That same year, they published a study that showed that psilocybin appeared to be more effective than escitalopram on depression. MAPS also published the first FDA phase three trial of MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD. In 2022, Psilocybin proved to be effective and decreased depression symptoms for up to a year. And in November 2022, Compass Pathways published a phase two double-blind trial of a single dose of psilocybin for an episode of treatment-resistant depression. In the study, 233 adults were randomly assigned to receive 25, 10, or one milligram of psilocybin. They found that there was a decrease on the MADRA scores or depression scores during the third week, most significant with the 25 milligrams. They also saw that the adverse effects, such as headaches, nausea, and dizziness, was most common with the 25 milligram. Suicidal ideation and self-injurious behaviors were also more common in the higher doses. As psychedelic, as psychedelic research continues to unfold, we have discovered many things about psychedelic substances. For instance, psychedelic's primary mechanism of action is thought to be due through the activation of the postsynaptic serotonin 2A receptor. It is thought that they also work in the serotonin 2C receptor and the tyrosine kinase B receptor and the prosynaptic serotonin 1A receptor. Psychedelics can be divided by their chemical structure into tryptamines, ergolines, and phenethylamines. There are atypical compounds such as MDMA, which has the same psychological effects, but a different mechanism of action. So what are some of the potential therapeutic effects of psychedelics? Psilocybin, when given, in one or two doses has shown promise in reducing depression scores in patients with treatment-resistant depression. The effects of psilocybin can last between two to eight weeks and in some instances up to six to 12 months post-treatment. Psilocybin has also demonstrated positive outcomes in addressing tobacco use disorder, alcohol use disorder, and anxiety and depression related to life-threatening cancer. MDMA-assisted therapy has proven effective and safe in reducing severe PTSD symptoms and noticeably improving sleep, with improvements lasting for over a year. It also has showed potential in reducing eating disorder symptoms. 
LSD has shown a positive effect on individuals with anxiety disorders related to life-threatening illnesses, with effects lasting up to 12 months. So how do these substances work in the brain? As we all know, the brain consists of interconnected network systems that require a balance of modularity or subdivision of networks and integration or interconnection between the networks for proper working. At resting states, fMRI connectivity analysis have shown that these networks are organized in a resting functional activity and modularity and integration. During the acute effects of psychedelics, such as psilocybin, the resting functional brain activity, modularity, and integration between these networks decreases. As you can see in the slide, pre-psilocybin, the red, orange, and yellow color show more activity, and post-psilocybin, the blue color shows less activity. Psychedelics appear to decrease the activity and connectivity in brain regions crucial to self-referential processing, such as the default mode network, in particular, the posterior cingulate cortex. Overall, it has been described that the acute effects of class psychedelics on system level neural functioning can be summarized as a decrease in modularity and integration and an increase in the reconfiguration of communication and increased brain entropy. As we can see in the slide, there's more entropy after the red line. It is thought that this mechanism may play a role in the altered states of consciousness seen in psychedelics. Psychedelics have also been found to decrease brainwave amplitude, particularly the alpha band synchrony. For instance, decreased alpha synchrony in particular brain regions, such as the posterior cingulate cortex, has been associated with psilocybin-induced spiritual experiences and disintegration of the self or ego. The long-lasting therapeutic effects of psychedelics are believed to be due to multiple factors, including increase in neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, and a decrease in rigid thinking, in addition to the causation of new insights into emotions, behaviors, and experiences that lead to lasting change in perspectives and behaviors. It is thought that the amygdala and the medial prefrontal cortex play a crucial role in the long-lasting effects of psychedelics. The Rebus model theory suggests that psychedelics decrease the inhibitory input from the prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex, allowing for inputs from the amygdala and the hippocampus to have a greater influence, causing and wrench experiences, and emotional release. Studies have routinely reported that the most common adverse effects of psychedelics to be expected are elevated blood pressure and heart rate, psychological discomfort, including anxious or dysphoric reactions, and physical distress, including nausea, vomiting, and headaches. Despite being common, they can be managed with appropriate safeguards, and do not preclude the possibility of therapeutic benefit. Psychedelic assisted psychotherapy was first introduced to the scientific community in 1959. With this, this method diverges from the psycholytic method, which administer lower doses of psychedelics and focuses on administering higher doses to evoke a mystical type experiences. All the studies that we have discussed today include this modality. Not all the current studies 
on psychedelics are practicing this modality. So how does psychedelic assisted psychotherapy works? We first have a preparation session where the therapist builds a report and prepare the patient to receive the drug. Then the drug sessions occur where the patient is under medical supervision and with a therapist that is, has to be present two to four hours. And then it is finalized with integration sessions that are follow-up sessions after the drug sessions to help the client process what they have experienced. This comprehensive approach raises compelling questions about the necessity of such an extensive psychotherapy every time psychedelics are administered, as well as is the entire process indispensable for the efficacy of treatment or to prevent or minimize potential adverse effects? Moreover, considering the therapist's extended engagement of two to eight hours per patient during the drug administration, one must ponder the cost effectiveness of such an approach. Mystical experiences, which are marked by a deep sense of unity and transcendence are seen as a potential therapeutic mechanism in the psychedelic treatments. A systematic review of 12 studies investigating psychedelic therapy with psilocybin, ayahuasca, and ketamine found a significant association between the mystical experiences and symptom reduction in 10 of the studies across diverse areas as cancer-related distress, substance use disorders, and depressive disorders. However, to fully understand the therapeutic potential of psychedelics and its correlation with the mystical experience, there is a need of larger scale studies designed to minimize expectancy effects that possibly compares the effects between psychedelics. There are numerous questions about the therapeutic potential of psychedelics in psychiatry. And here at UMass, we plan to be part of this history. Notably, the interest in psychedelics of two prominent figures led to the introduction of psilocybin study at UMass. This initiative was facilitated by Dr. Rothschild, whose efforts were instrumental in bringing the study to fruition. In addition to the dedicated team at the Center for Psychopharmacologic Research and Treatment, which have made significant contributions to ensure the success of this groundbreaking research. The Center for Psychopharmacologic Research and Treatment has been selected as a study site for the COMPASS Pathways Phase three trial designed to evaluate the efficacy of psilocybin in treatment-resistant depression. If you have any patients that you think might be interested in participating, please contact Michelangela Jusif at the number in the screen. I'm gonna give you guys a few minutes so you can take pictures if you wanna um, refer any patients. I want to thank you all for your time. And I guess I went very fast. So we have time for questions. Thank you very much. Excellent. Before we take questions, I would just add one thing. This is a great uh, history. Um, the MAPS group um, has filed with the FDA for using MDMA for PTSD. And there's something called a FDUFA date, which is the date by which the FDA must render a decision. And that date is August either 15th or 17th, sometime in mid-August. Um, and the, um, the MAPS um, nonprofit, I guess is the best way to describe them, is starting to uh, look around the country for sites that would be willing to deliver it because there'll only be 
certified sites. And actually the model uh, with the assisted psychotherapy is very similar to what we're doing uh, for treatment resistant depression with, um, with compass. So um, we're going to be exploring with maps, whether it's feasible for us to, to be a, to be a site uh, for, for this. That's great. All right. We'll open it up for questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Maite. This was awesome. Um, I really enjoyed the history piece. And my question is kind of broad, so forgive me. But um, when I think about uh, the psychedelics, I struggle, you know, with thinking about each one individually or lumping them together as psychedelics with one purpose and one brain activity and one use. So when you looked at these and did your research, was it clear that, you know, perhaps psilocybin is useful for uh, end of life anxiety and NDMA is useful for PTSD, or is the research just not there yet? So, so usually, right, research um, for psilocybin, it's it's um, more research, right, for uh, substance use disorders, life and anxieties, and depression. NDMA appears to be um, research for PTSD. Um, other substances like ayahuasca or LSD, they're more related to um, um, end of life anxieties. Thank you. Other questions? You know, um, Mayte brought up a good point is one of the things that's unclear is whether the psychotherapy is a necessary part of this. There are companies developing uh, <clears throat> psychedelic treatments. <clears throat> you had one of them on the slide, but they're short acting. So the effects wear off in two hours and you, there's not enough time to do psychotherapy. So there, no, there is no psych, there, there's no psychotherapy during the psychedelic experience. And so we may learn something from, from, from those particular studies. Based on that, have there been any studies, I don't know how you would even do this, but I know that there have been studies, I believe with ketamine, um, where people are not necessarily awake while they have the medication, maybe they're anesthetized or some, something else. Like, could there be a way to find out if it, is it the experiential, uh, you know, time that you're having the experience, or is there some sort of downstream uh, lasting effect from the psychedelic neurotransmitter changes, receptor changes that is is the active ingredient? Has anyone looked at that? So, uh, yeah, they're actually actively looking into that. It seems like what they're focusing is on having a mystical experience, which people would describe almost like, right, um, that sense of unity or transcendence that they think plays a role in decreasing, right, the symptoms of depression or PTSD. However, we don't have the science to say, right, to answer that question with certainty. Hi, thank you. Um, that was really interesting. Um, I'm sort of wondering, like, uh, you know, with these compelling findings, is there like a sort of sense that this is going to be a intervention for sort of acute symptoms? Um, or is this going to be like a therapy that would be able to be maintained safely for people? Or, you know, what, what would it actually look like as an intervention? And I think that's a great question. Um, and then right to that, we can ponder, right? How is this going to be cost effective? You have a therapist two to eight hours with a patient during one session. Um, how expensive is it going to be? So we we still don't have um, an answer to that question. Um, basically, right now, the model that we're using is the ones that it's followed in the research protocols. Yeah. So there's a lot we don't know. I mean, yeah. that's why we're doing study. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, in the phase two study, um, there was some suggestion of an increase in suicidal ideation, yeah. not during the dosing session down yeah. down the road. So that's the, the safety of that still has to be figured out. Mayte alluded to the cost yeah. of the therapy. 
Um, and, um, you know, we, we don't really know yet if it works. So this idea of making it available to the general public is really dangerous. I mean, you know, by the way, Oregon is regretting this now. They're trying to repeal. Uh, uh, it's not because of psilocybin, but, it's, you know, other drugs. Um, and there, there are people in our own state. I don't know if you go if you go grocery shopping, they come up to you and say, would you sign a petition to improve mental health care in Massachusetts? You figure, oh, great. And it's a it's a petition for Silas to get Silas legalized Silas and get that on the ballot, which is really, really, da really dangerous. So um, and I think right, one thing we can learn from history, it's that when psychedelics were introduced to the general public without regulation, that's when we started to see a lot of bad things happened. Um, and right, one of the things that we can see right now, it's that cannabis was legalized without any regulations. And now we have, we're seeing more patients, like everybody using cannabis, thinking that it's a medication, and then seeing a lot of teenagers having psychotic breaks due to the cannabis. So it's, I don't want to think like it's good or bad, but I think, right, it's not safe to bring something without us having the knowledge of what it's gonna do and how we can manage it. Questions online. Um, as, as patients strike out on their own to obtain treatment, recommendations, warnings, references. Well, I think we kinda. So I, there's some, so I, I have a patient actually that it's a bipolar patient that told me that in their group therapy, another patient said, I don't meet criteria for the study so I think I'm just gonna go and get the medication and try it myself. And my patient suggested she wanted to do it also. And so I, I just told her what I thought that I don't think this is a good idea for her. Um, Cause given the bipolar disorder, the possibility of becoming manic or more depressed, like we don't, we don't have the information of how this acts. By the way, the other thing uh, that's yet to be studied is whether you can use mini doses to assist regular psychotherapy. Um, there's some thinking about that too. All right, uh, question uh, to follow up on the question of lumping together psychedelics. There's a there's a ballot proposal for Massachusetts to legalize and begin psychedelic administration centers for mental health benefits. This bill includes ibogaine in addition to psilocybin, DMT, and mescaline. Could you comment on the relevant risks and benefits of these different psychedelics for use in the general population? Well, I, I don't like to use or promote a use of anything if I don't have knowledge about it, right? And I still think there, there are too many questions to answer. We, we don't even, right, we're starting to get to know what are the appropriate doses? What are these side effects? How are we going to manage the side effects? So I, and then right in community, you can see many people incorrectly diagnosed that may think they're, they have treatment resistant depression, but are truly bipolar. And then you expose this people to possibly, right, get those treatments and getting worse. So I, I don't think it would be, I think there it, it's too many risks. Um, at this point, I think once we have more information, um, it's going to be something that it's going to be viable because I, I do think it does have some therapeutic potential, but it has to be regulated. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I mean, it's experimentation. We just, I mean, we're supposed to be practicing evidence-based medicine based on science. Mm -hmm. And then just to go ahead and tell your patient to, you know, go, go, go try something that hasn't been studied. I mean, I think that's that that's experimentation without the informed consent and without IRB oversight. Um, in terms of the current study that you guys are doing now, um, what is, are you, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. Is there a recommended uh, length of time for patients to be on the therapy um, the psilocybin or like, what is the long-term follow-up? Um, is it similar guidelines to like SSRIs in terms of length of time on treatment or will the study help kind of determine that? So basically the patient, they, they write that they're randomized to receive the, the dose or placebo. 
Um, so you prepare them, they receive a single dose, and then you do the integra integration sessions and you evaluate them. Depending on how they do, they may meet criteria to have a redosing um, if they're not doing um, well or to op um, enter the open label study, if I'm correct, right, Dr. Westrom? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the th that's one of the things we're looking at. You know, you get one dose and you have the option actually of getting two more dosages if you're not better or if you relapse. But one of the key questions we'll learn from, and, and this is this is not the only study that's going on. There's other ones with different paradigms. One of the key questions in getting back to the practical use of this is how long does this last? You know, if it just lasts a month or two, it's not going to be very practical. If it lasts a year, then maybe you know, for, particularly for people with treatment-resistant depression, then maybe, maybe it'd be worthwhile. But that's going to that's an unanswered, um, an unanswered question. I mean, uh, somebody online, Dr. Lightborn, comments that there's also a question of whether people will obtain uh, optimal benefits without co-administered psychotherapy. That's a that's a mm -hmm. key question: is wh whether the psychotherapy is is necessary or not. I mean, if I had to guess. You need some some kind of psychotherapy while you're going through this experience. Otherwise, it, it's it's reminiscent of the guys who lived across the hall from me senior year in college. Who who um, I miss the '60s, but I caught the tail end of it. Um, they didn't graduate. They did. They didn't graduate. Yeah, um, I was wondering too about thinking about um, like adolescence and. Mm -hmm. um, and child and adolescent use of this, obviously is, I don't think being tested on kids yet, mm -hmm. um, or kids under 18, but thinking about too, like historically, I feel like this is kind of, and you tell me if I'm wrong, cause I could be analogous to the situation with like synthetic morphine and mm -hmm. it's great and it's wonderful. And there was a time when we could get it over the counter and then yeah. There was a time when we couldn't for a good reason. And um, I'm curious because we haven't identified that there's any like physiological dependence that develops with, with these kind of drugs. Do you, do you think that it would be a safer thing to have potentially introduced? No, no. Yeah. I, I actually, I, there are too many questions that we have not answered. I think right in the in the past they they use it to for for like autism and OCD and and there's a study for OCD right now and it it showed therap uh, therapeutic potential. Um, however, to legalize it as right the synthetic opioids, I don't think it, it's not. I don't think it's going to be a problem of having like an opioid epidemic and an addiction epidemic. I think it's going to be a problem of having right bad side effects like bad trips, psychotic breaks, flashbacks or suicides that that's going to be the problem or having people write that the medication does not work for them and they can become psychotic or they can become manic. And right. That's something that instead of us helping them, we just have to treat them after. Sorry, just to follow up on that, I was curious about what the data right now are showing, if anything, about, and you were mentioning bipolar disorder, what are the contraindications? For whom might this be contraindicated? For people with um, psychosis or bipolar disorder, there are some studies um, for people with schizophrenia, with MDMA. However, they have to be stable for a, a long time, and it's only to manage their negative symptoms. And it's to see if the drug actually does not makes them psychotic. That's the primary outcome of that study. Regarding bipolar disorder, I must be honest, I haven't read that much about it. But from my clinical judgment, I wouldn't recommend it to those patients because I'm scared they might have a psychotic break or I'm scared they might become manic. In, in our study, you can't have any history, personal or family history of psychosis. Yeah. So I do, I actually had a question for myself while I did this and was, is this going to be a possible treatment for opioid use disorder and to help us out with the opioid epidemic? Um, I don't think there are any studies studying opioid use disorder, uh, psychedelics 
for opioid use disorder, but it appears that there's one study that has shown that use of psychedelics decreases the possibility of developing an opioid use disorder. Um, but I think, right, if, if it's a therapeutic, if, if it helps, it would be wonderful. Do you have any knowledge on the method of psychotherapy used um, during the psychedelic administrated treatment sessions? So I, I have not been trained as a, as a therapist. Um, we do have Dr. Ashkin, Dr. Rashler, they're both trained as therapists, so they can let you know a little bit more about it. But um, from books that I've read, it seems that they, like from, from the books that I read and experiences from other people, basically people might have what it's called like a bad trip because they feel like their body stops like their body disappears, they're not alive, they go into basically a very stressful or anxious stress situation. And the therapist, the integration session is for you to learn how to deal with those um, experiences and basically to let yourself go. Um, just knowing, right, that there's something, somebody taking care of your body while well, that is happening, that you're safe. So you can basically go with the flow of the experience and usually at the end of the, as the drug subsides, people say, right, they have this um, transcendence moment. Everything is like they are re re reborn in life. Like everything seems connected. Like it's almost like life is an energy and there's a bigger, bigger consciousness. This is from what I've read. Um, so, if, yeah. If you want to learn more about it, if you run into Dr. Iskan at, uh, or Dr. Wexler, they went through 80 hours of training, mm -hmm. which you know, one of us did. So, um, but my understanding is that what happens in the room is kind of, it's kind of um, almost analytic in a sense that they, they resp only respond to what the patient is saying, but you'd have to ask them a little bit more. I'm not even allowed in, nobody else is allowed in the room, you know, what's, what's going on. So we're just checking blood pressure and pulse and things like that. You're welcome. If someone is having a bad trip, if someone is having a bad trip, is there something that they can do? Like, and clearly I'm not a psychiatrist. Um, is there like, can they stop it? Can they give like something to reverse it? Or is it like, oh, you're just going to have to wait this one out, buddy. So in... in in our study, right, if you become psychotic, we're going to give you an antipsychotic or benzodiazepines. Um, and basically, right, if, if somebody becomes psychotic due to using psychedelics and they come to the emergency room, I would, yeah, I would give them antipsychotics or what we call a B12 um, to help them, right, um, ease the, the anxiety of the bad trip. So I'm told that that, at least at the 25 milligram dose that we're using, that that has been an extremely rare event. Um, the therapists do some things first. Um, and, but, you know, we have, um, uh, a benzodiazepine and, and an antipsychotic on site if we need it, but I'm told I've, I haven't had to use it. And I'm told that it's been pretty rare for anyone to have to use. And by the way, the whole thing lasts six to eight hours and then it's over. All right. Thank you, Mayte. Very, very, uh, interesting, particularly the so history. Much.